Hey everybody, it's Andy, helping you build a career you love. Today we are gonna be talking about the five worst assumptions to make in a job interview, and we're doing it live office hours style. So welcome to everybody. I see you guys are shuffling in. Get in there, get in the chat, say hi. Put the question marks in front of the many questions that I know you have so I can find them at the end of the session. We're gonna do a great Q&A, and whatever you do, Make sure you are subscribed to my U channel because it genuinely hurts me when you don't get all my new content. So I hope you guys are I hope you guys are shuffling in, having some fun. We got a great one today. Let's jump right in because this is a nice full uh, lesson that we're gonna go through. And as I mentioned, five of the worst assumptions you can make. You can call them myths, lies, assumptions. They're probably a combination of all of these things, but they are those elements of the job interview that leaves you scratching your head when you thought you did well and you didn't get the job and you didn't get hired. Well, today we're gonna talk about those. You're gonna know what they are, how to overcome them to get hired. So I'm actually gonna jump right in. We're gonna jump right in with the first one. So this first one, this first, this is kind of a, a, maybe it's a myth, maybe it's an assumption, but this one comes from the fact that there are two things employers love about recruiting. They love people they know, and they love the path of least resistance. So what those two loves do for them is it doesn't always get them the most qualified candidates. So myth number one is that the most qualified candidates don't always get the job interview. Now that might not be startling news to you, but the way in which and, and the tactics you need to overcome that I think are important for us to discuss. So let's talk about that because I want you to understand what's actually happening on the recruitment side of the table. So when you think about when you think about the recruit when you think about recruiters and you think about employers, who wouldn't love? Who wouldn't love to get a referral from one of their own employees, somebody they know and love and trust, uh, hopefully, um, and, and, and having that employee vouch for somebody that they know or somebody that they know but is willing to go to bat for this individual? That would be great. I would love those people. We at Mile Walk always want to look at those people, and I'm sure that you all that are hirers that are out there, you would prefer that route too. And even you job candidates, you know it's a much better route to get to the employer. And then that goes along with the fact that recruiters, most corporate recruiters, not all corporate recruiters, but most corporate recruiters are not actually spending time recruiting, even though that's their title. Uh, they're fielding the inbound flow of candidates, and the f first and preferred route is employee referrals. But the second part of the path of least resistance is the applicant tracking system. So the applicant tracking system, believe it or not, for the employer is the path of least resistance. It might be your path of most painful resistance. But between networking and the applicant tracking system, most corporate recruiters are getting a flow of candidates, so they're just evaluating whoever comes in. That's not necessarily the most qualified candidates. If they wanted the most qualified candidates, they would be reaching out, out into the field, out into the world themselves, or they're, they're having pushes with their employees, or third-party recruitment firms, or however it might be. But most of them are not, and you need to be aware of this. So how can you overcome this? So let's take these one at a time. So the, the first piece about the networking and what you can do to network, I know a lot of you that follow me, you know I talk about networking a lot. I've even gone so far as to tell you exactly how much networking to do based on who you are. So if you've seen my job search masterclass or you've seen my live office hours on why your job search is taking so long, I've talked about that. And what, we, what we've done as a, my, my recruitment for Mile Walk, gathering statistics from all of the people that we've interviewed over the years, that's more than 15,000 now, we capture data about how they find their job so that we can use those statistics to come up with better tools, better techniques, more information for you. So one thing that I wanna share, because I know a lot of people have a question about, well, how much networking time should I spend in relation to all the five or six other activities that go along with job searching, like looking online and applying and researching companies and all that good stuff. But I wanna give you a couple of those stats just so you have a frame of reference. 
If you are a higher earner, say over six figures, you earn more than $100,000, whatever your age, or you are a more tenured professional, so let's say above 50 years old, you have a 46% chance of finding your job through somebody that you know or somebody they know. And if you are, let's say, in the lower earning bracket or a younger professional, you still have 27% of a chance to find your job through somebody you know. So, so if you take a look at these stats, if you are in the higher earning bracket, you should probably be spending almost 50%, about half of your time networking. And if you are in the lower earning bracket or you are a younger professional, you should still be spending about 25% of your time networking. That will help give you a leg up, hopefully get in through the route of an employee referral or some recommendation or some warm introduction. Then when you think about the other thing that I mentioned, the applicant tracking system, I know some of you, a lot of you, are, you're eventually going to have to put your, your resume into an applicant tracking system. Hopefully you have a warm introduction before you need to do that. But regardless of whether you have that warm introduction or you're going in cold, we call it cold traffic, but basically you don't know anybody at the company, you're going to put your resume into the applicant tracking system. There are some things stylistically, uh, there's some matching things that you can do and also some tools that you can take advantage of that'll help you bolster that resume so you have a better shot of actually getting the job interview. I don't know if you've seen it, but I have a video out there called Three Free Tools for Your Resume to Beat the Applicant Tracking System. One of them is a resume, uh, webinar that I've developed called Three Secrets to Get Your Resume Noticed. The other one is my resume content builder. It's a wonderful free giveaway that I give in the free webinar. But the third, the third tool that I like to recommend after you develop your resume, look at the job descriptions for which you want to apply, and then optimize your resume as best you can using the right keywords and all that good stuff, is I love to recommend JobScan. It's not a perfect tool, but it is the best tool I found in the market to allow you to take your resume, import it into its system. It's free, certainly for a while. Uh, import it into its system, and then take the job description from either the corporate website or the job board or wherever you found it and put that in a job scan and it will give you a number of suggestions based on how closely your resume aligns to that job description. So I like recommending that tool. I will put links to all those videos I mentioned in the notes, but that's the first myth or assumption that people make. Now you might know that that's the case and you know you faced hurdles, I'm sure you've run into these roadblocks, but you gotta make sure you're doing the right things because the employers genuinely, genuinely love the path of least resistance. They really do. So let's talk about the second assumption. This one, now, 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 now we're, all right, we're a little warmed up. We're getting into the big boys now. Well, the one thing that I want you to know about companies is they don't always know who they seek. They don't know who they seek. I know you're looking at a job description. I'm sure you're looking at their corporate website and you were thinking about, well, this looks pretty in order. I've got all the information. They look like they know what they're doing. It looks like everybody's having fun. But let me let me tell you something and let me tell you where I get this from. You know, and I know you've seen me hold up the interview intervention book, but you don't see me hold up this little beauty very often. This book, The Hiring Prophecies, won a gold award for best business careers and sales book of 2016, beat out like 8,000 books. And in this book is more than 10 years of studies, interviews, analysis, data collection, uh, surveys with thousands of companies, tens of thousands of individuals to talk about the, the most critical factors in hiring the right person. And as I went out and did all my interviewing with these corporations, I personally interviewed more than 200 and some odd, but there were thousands more that contributed data. One thing was very apparent in the conclusions that we drew about the factors that lead to retention success. So not only do I have to recruit the person, but success is not the recruitment itself and hiring the person. The success is hiring a long-standing successful employee who's happy. So in looking at that and analyzing all that data, there were four major components that led to that retention success. And I wanna talk about those because it was very apparent that companies did not identify these appropriately as they were evaluating people that they were bringing into their organization. Now there were four of them. 
but I want to talk about three of them very, very quickly. But the four of them were cultural fit was number one by miles. The second one was capabilities. The third was track record of achievement of the individual. And the fourth one was their particular skill set. So how well they knew the particular job they were being hired for. But there are three that I want to talk about right now. And that's culture, capabilities, and skills. We're going to take them over the next couple of minutes. But I want to talk about culture for a second. Imagine, and you all, I mean, your employees, a lot of you, some of you are hirers. Think about, does your organization actually understand down to the right level of detail what its culture is. So think about what an employer has to do in order to make sure that they're hiring somebody with the right culture for their company. They have to know what the culture is, meaning they have to list it all out, these specific adjectives that go along with defining what the personality of the organization is. So they have to have a list of what those cultural traits are. Then, in addition to the list, they actually need to define each of those components because just because you have the word doesn't mean we all understand specifically what that word means. And the third thing that they need to do, not only to communicate all of that to everybody, is the interviewers and the people that are interviewing you have to be crystal clear on the questions that they need to ask you in order to elicit the information from you to determine whether you can actually fit the culture. Actually fit the culture. So. When we talk about this kind of this myth or assumption number two about the company knowing, I want to talk about culture for a minute here. We'll pick up the other ones as we roll through. But when you think about the culture of an organization, if you can demonstrate in the interview that you align culturally, that will go over well. Even if they have not gone to the lengths of prettying up the documentation, identifying all the traits, identifying all the definitions, knowing which questions to ask you, if you as a job seeker can extract that information and roll it into your stories that you tell and the responses that you give when you are asked questions, you will definitely be able to overcome the fact that they might not be clear about it or defined it, but you and your goal of being hired if you like this company is you're going to significantly increase your chances. So the first thing that I want you to do is start looking online to see if you can ascertain what the culture is. Do they speak about the type of people that they're looking for? So notice words like entrepreneurial, leaders, um, uh, uh, servant leaders, uh, self-starters, ambitious, all whatever they are, welcoming, communicative, these kinds of traits. They may be there, they may not be there. They might even be in the job descriptions. That's great too. But the one thing that you can do is in your lowest risk interview in the process, which is the screen, you are likely exchanging information about you. You're trying to get a little information about the company. You're likely doing it, say, say 80, 90% of the time with a recruiter or a human resources professional. You should ask them, could you define the cultural traits of the company. So as you are in this interview and you are trying to gather some information, number one, to see if the company is a good one for you, but also to sell yourself in the process, you're doing a little reconnaissance. So if, if you're interviewing me, I would say to you, you know, culture is really important to me. I want to make sure that I'm getting with an organization that is culturally aligned with me and I'm culturally aligned to it. Could you give me the top five to 10 adjectives you would use to describe the culture in the organization. And could you tell me what you mean by those if there's any room for interpretation? So now the human resources person or the recruiter or whoever you're speaking with will give you their insight. And you could, you could do a little back and forth about what they mean specifically. And let me give you an example of what I mean by how this stuff can have such disparate meaning to all the people you're speaking with throughout the process. If you're interviewing with 10 people, they might have 10 different definitions of what entrepreneurial means and different ways and biases of thinking about it. So if you asked me, if you were interviewing with me and you said, Andy, entrepreneurial, that's great. What do you mean? I would say, here's my definition. I wrote this one, it's my own. This is a person, in my mind, this is a person who has a vision and without regard for resources can make that vision a reality. Can make that vision a reality. So all of my interviewers that were interviewing you would be armed with a question that says, 
Tell me about a time when you had an idea, your organization didn't give you any resources and you made that happen. If you knew in advance that that question was coming, you'd stay up all night and you'd think about a story. But if you didn't know that that question was coming, you at least now know what it is they're looking for and you can better, you can better package up your response. But if somebody else down the road thinks, well, I just think people that work for small companies are entrepreneurial. That's not true either. And just because you work for large organizations doesn't mean you can't satisfy my definition of an entrepreneur. So you've got to be really thoughtful and diligent about getting this intelligence. But I would definitely, definitely get it from the HR person or recruiter early in the process. And then what I would do is I would mirror that and I would give it back to them Called, just called mirroring, but basically you want to give them back what they gave you and tell them why you're entrepreneurial. That sounds great. I'm entrepreneurial. Here's why. Okay, so you can get it in the screen and then use it throughout, and then you can check throughout, but make sure that even if the company's not crystal clear, if they think entrepreneurial is part of their culture, then you are giving them responses that include how you are entrepreneurial. All right, let's go on with those other couple because this leads into myth number three or assumption number three. Don't assume, by any stretch, that the interviewers know what skills you need, what capabilities you need, and that they know how to evaluate them. Just because somebody's sitting across from you asking you questions and interviewing you, and I'm a, you know, I'm a senior engineer who codes in Java or C++ or whatever I'm doing, don't assume that I know what skills and capabilities you need to be great at that trade. It's a big mistake because what most people are doing is, number one, you have to realize who these people are, right? They're, they're paid to do their job. They probably have some skills that allow them to do their job effectively, but this is interviewing you. This is, this is, this is a di whole different ball of wax. So what most of the interviewers are doing is they're looking for particular skills that you have that match up with what they think you need. So I think you need to know how to code in Java in order to do this effectively. I think you know how to sell consumer product goods to do this job effectively. That's generally what they think. But you can overcome this myth and help them because, because and think about it, I wanna, I wanna, actually I wanna do a little more definition here of what I mean by capabilities. For you to be very good at your job and to grow through the ranks and to be a successful long-term employee, you do need the skills to do the job. However, however, the studies, the studies in here show that capabilities and the foundational abilities for someone are far are a far greater indication of long-term success. What do I mean by that? So I could choose as a uh, as a corporate citizen in an interview, if I'm interviewing three different engineers, what I would prefer is to hire the engineer that matches most closely with the capabilities that I know that that engineer needs to be a long-term employee. So what might those capabilities be? Well, the skills, for example, are do you know how to code in C++ or Java or whatever your language is, or do you know how to sell this particular type of product or service? That's the skill. But the capability is, you know, do they have the right analytical skills? Are they organized? Have they actually probably seen a variety of different software languages so that they understand how to draw parallels? So they have these foundational abilities that actually transcend whatever their particular job function is as it relates to a technologist designing software. If companies actually reverse engineered the most the greatest superstars that they have in the organization, they would know what those capabilities are. Then they don't only have to know what the capabilities are, they have to know how to ask questions in order to elicit information from you to determine if you could actually if you actually have those capabilities. But they don't do that. They don't do that. They take a very superficial look at your skill set. So what can you do? What can you do to shine better when, when you recognize that these interviewers probably don't really know what those capabilities are? Well, here's what you can do. You can learn what those capabilities are. And how might you do that? Well, the first thing is whatever I am, Whatever I am, a project manager, a business analyst, an accountant, a salesperson, it doesn't make any difference. 
First thing I would do is I would look at the corporate website and I would try to get that culture down. Then I would look at the job descriptions, not only my job description, but all the job descriptions that precede mine, meaning what's the next lower level, then my job, then the next one above it, and so on. And I would look for the traits that they list in the job description and I would get very familiar if I saw them. So some of them might include in there, you know, want strong organizational skills, want strong analytical skills, uh, would like you to have programmed in a wide variety of languages, whatever it might be. Anything that is not specific to the skill is likely a trait that they're looking for. That's another thing that you can do. And then another thing that I always recommend that you do, it sounds silly, but just Google it. Literally, Google what capabilities make a great whatever. I did this for, for different professions. I was trying to help people. Um, uh, job search in professions that I hadn't really recruited for before, like a chef and some of these others. And it was amazing how many videos, blog posts, articles, books, and other things will come up that tell me a chef needs to have great organizational skills, good stamina, can be a multitasker, and so, you know, so on. So in addition to knowing that that has too much acidity in it, they actually have to have all these other skills. You could do that. And then what I would do is as I was preparing for my job interview, I would make sure that I was highlighting how I had those capabilities, whether they were listed on the job description or not. That's going to help you overcome that. And then the other thing that you can do is you want to make sure, and this is a little easier to do, is to map your skills. So your particular hardcore domain skills, the fact that you developed in this software language, the fact that you have sold these particular props, you want to make sure that you are mapping where you've done what they're asking you to do in your responsibilities of the job descriptions. So you want to make sure you're thinking about where have I done that before, specifically done that, as this will serve as an example of the fact that I have experience doing that specific thing. Capabilities are showing your demonstrated capacity to be awesome in the future. So there's slight difference. So skills, present day, I walk in the door, here's what I can do capabilities, here's that fact that I'm a great bet for tomorrow. Okay, so it's it's important that you understand the distinction there. Let's roll and let's, you know what, let's keep beating up these interviewers, why don't we? Myth number four, don't think for one second that the interviewer is actually prepared, is actually prepared. And I'm going to cut them some slack here. Let's not be too tough on interviewers. Think about this. Think about this. These people, are thrown in front of you. They're getting paid probably the big bucks to do something other than interview you. It's two o'clock in the afternoon and the HR person is chasing down the interviewer to make sure that she's in the conference room on time and has your resume and so forth. And all the interviewers thinking about is, oh goodness, my boss is yelling at me. I got a client call at four and the project deadline at five, I'm not, I'm not ready for it yet. So they're very distracted. They, they are not, right, they didn't recruit you. They don't have an emotional attachment, investment, or anything to you. And they've been given a resume that's probably too long, too thick, cover letters, all this other, other stuff that you as requisites have to, have to shove in their face. And here they are at 2 o'clock on Thursday interviewing you. And they probably have glanced at your resume. If they've even glanced at it, they've glanced at it for two seconds. So, so what do they do? They ask you to tell me about yourself and walk me through your resume and all that good stuff. So I want you to know, number one, you want to make sure that you actually have your resume because not only, not only might they not have it, they probably didn't look at it, but even if they have it, they probably didn't look at it. So you want to make sure that you have copies just in case they don't have it with them. And then what are they going to do? They're going to ask you to tell me about yourself and walk me through your resume and walk me through your resume. And that's where you should start doing backflips because they've now turned complete control of the interview over to you. And I'm not going to go into how exactly to do the tell me about yourself and walk me through your resume because I have videos out there on my YouTube channel for tell me about yourself, best way to respond and walk me through your resume, best way to respond. They're very popular videos. I'll put the links you know, in the cards or in the notes or whatever. You'll be able to access them. But you have to have the mindset that they know nothing about you. Don't assume that they've read all your highlights and all your accolades and know all your awards. You've got to assume that they are empty and you have to educate them completely 
on who you are and who you are. So if you check those videos out, you'll know how to do that. All right. So what I want to do now is I want to talk about, uh oh, I think I skipped a card. Here we go. All right. Uh, fifth myth or assumption is that the employer actually knows what success looks like. Okay, so now, now I wanna hire you and I need you to be successful, except I'm not even sure what success looks like. And if they don't know what success looks like, you are in real trouble if you take that job because you don't know what success looks like and you won't know what to do and work toward and how you're being evaluated and all that good stuff. So, this comes up every live office hours. It comes up on virtually every webinar that I do live. But here's what I want you to do. Whoop. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to ask them and then tell them. So ask, then tell. Okay, ask, then tell. And what do I mean by that? One of my favorite questions for you to ask the job interviewer while you're in the interview is, if I or, or whoever you're going to hire was to come here and work, in one year from now, exactly what would success look like? So what will I have accomplished, completed, done that you would consider a raging success? Then what they'll do is hopefully they will tell you. But if they don't tell you, you should close up your brief bag and walk out the interview because you're really going to be in trouble if you take that job. But when they tell you, hopefully they, they know, if they can tell you or at least speculate or give you an idea of what success in their mind will look like, then what you should do is spend some time immediately, spend some time shifting into storytelling again about exactly how you would accomplish what they told you the goals or the accomplishments would be. And why is this a great idea? Because if you can get them to envision what it would be like to have you working there and you are actually walking them through what you would do, they will hire you. The person who can shift, the job seeker, who can shift the interview into the future and spend more time talking about the future with the employer and what it will be like with them working there and how you will kick butt in that job, that person is going to get the job because the employer now has a more a comfort level and they're imagining how you would do it. They could already see you as part of the team. If you are spending more time in the future, this is especially important for senior folks, all you, all you, all you big dogs out there, you got to get, you got to be spending 80, 90% of the conversation in the future. But regardless of your level, the more time you can spend getting them to imagining you working there versus them evaluating your background, the better off you'll do in the interview. If they are spending and you are spending a lot of time explaining yourself and your stories and all that good stuff, they're only getting the fact that you, that of what you did, they're not getting a good inclination of what you can do. And they are hiring you, even though they don't, a lot of times they don't think about it this way. They are hiring you for what you can do, not what you've done. Not what you've done. And the best way to be sure about what you can do is for you to tell me how you would do it. Then I can imagine, oh, you will, you will be all right. You'll, you'll, you'll knock it out. You'll knock it out. So you want to get them shifting to the future. So that's that's that. Those are the five myths. But I want one more. I want to toss one more in because this is like super important. And you know, I called it a bonus, but it's really, <laughs> it's like the number one the number one myth. So just like the most qualified candidates don't always get the job interviews, the most qualified candidates don't always get the job. They really don't. So these five I just gave you, you know, knowing that the most qualified candidates don't always get the interviews, knowing that the company doesn't know exactly who they seek, knowing that the interviewers don't necessarily know how to evaluate your skills and your capabilities or that the interviewers are prepared or that they know what success looks like. And all that, all that is supported by the data in this book. But, but the real key, the real key is that there are a lot of miscommunications during the interviews. And the candidate who can, uh, can show the employer how she fits and the value she will contribute to what they need at the moment with clear communication is the one who's going to get the job. So to overcome this issue, to make sure that you as the most qualified candidate do get the job, or I'll give you all the tricks if you're not the most qualified candidate, I want you to check out the free webinar I have called Three Keys to Ace Any Job Interview. That's an hour long of coaching. It goes into all this stuff, totally covers it, all the communication trip wires and all that good stuff. 
All right, so I want to wrap up the teaching portion of this here. So for all of you that are watching this on the recording, thanks for, thanks for watching. If you like this, hit the thumbs up. Make sure to share this. There's plenty more new videos every week and live office hours on Thursday. Till next week, I'll see you. For everybody else who's here, we're gonna go to the chat and uh, and have some fun. And wait, and I know I've been holding up the, the interview book, but if you do not have the interview intervention, the new edition, the, the hardbound of this little beauty, uh, it's free. It's it's uh, it's free. I give you the book. It's 29 bucks. I give you the ebook and the audio book. That's another 27 bucks. I give you my favorite ebook, which is how to interview the employer, 75 great questions to ask before you take any job. That's the promotion right now. All that's free. Uh, and anywhere in the world, I will ship this book to you for $7 to pick it, pack it, and get it there. So I don't care where you are. I don't care where you live. If you're in Perth, Australia, as we, as we know, is the farthest place on the planet from Chicago, where I am, it's seven bucks. So I want to thank everybody for spending 120 people. That's great. Um, let's go to the chat. And uh, I hope that was enjoyable. Uh, I didn't see anything flashing and Kara yelling at me or anything like that on the Slack. I think I got most of my points in there. Um, let's go to the questions. And folks, if you're loving this, man, I am going to, uh, you know, I'm going to leave this one up and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Circulate it because we're going to spend uh, the next 30 minutes taking your questions. So uh, share it out there that you're here with me. Tell your friends, get them over, anybody who needs help, career coaching of any kind. All right. And let me see. Gordon, great to see you. Shar, great to see you. Boom, question right away. Here we go. Shar asks, do you believe two-page resumes should be duplexed? If not, do you think you should staple or paperclip the two pages? And Shar, what I would do is I would not, uh, I would not duplex them. And I did not know what she meant, but the good news about the, the prelude chat to the 11 o'clock hour is we we chitty chat back and forth and, and what she meant is print it on both sides i would not print it on both sides let them just print it um don't set it up that way and usually that's a function of the printer itself uh, who's printing it out normally you're going to send them a word document or a pdf that's got page one page two uh, i'm assuming you mean when you bring it in i would not i would bring them two pages i would staple it um because a lot of times what the what the interviewers tend to do is they'll write on the back. Uh, I know it's it's ridiculous. People walk in, they don't have a notepad, they don't have their questions, uh, the, the the job interviewers that is, and so they they start writing stuff on your resume. I would not do that. I mean, I would like adamantly like I'm not saying like, hey, this is a preference. Don't do it. Leave them blank. Pay, leave the backs blank for them. I know it sounds silly, but that's just a fact. And you don't want them, you know, trying to you know annotate in the you know one inch margins. So I hope I hope that helps. Emily, great to see you. Kimberly, nice to see you. Hey, Daniel, hope you are not uh, getting caught in the fires, man. I hope uh, I hope you're safe. Gordon's got a question. I have been advised by two separate recruiters that I talk too much. That is, I give over elaborate answers. How can I keep my answers brief without sounding unhelpful? Okay, I love this question, and Gordon, I want to refer you. And I, I know you've got, uh, you know, you're in, you're in some of my programs. I'm not sure if you've seen uh, for you uh, the interview, uh, interviewing session of the boot camp or the program or the, the videos in the interview intervention course. But for all of you that are not in my paid programs. Um, that uh, webinar that I mentioned at the end of the session, three keys to ace any job interview, shows you the five points and the steps to tell your stories. Now, people ask me this. I want to. I want to be really clear. And you know, you all are here with me. You're you're my people. Um, you know, people always ask me. They say, well, why don't you put uh, videos out there that talk about how to answer behavioral questions? It makes no difference. Uh, whether you're getting asked a behavioral interviewing question, which is about history, or a situational interviewing question, which is about the future, in the way in which you tell your stories. So I first thing I would do is I want to refer everybody to that webinar, because in that webinar, the points that I go through, and for Gordon's benefit, everybody else, 
There are five uh, story, I call it storytelling, but basically in your response, there are five things you need to do in order to make your story believable and memorable and keeping it tight and also make you likable. And those five things are, you need to, number one, keep it short and simple. Number two, you have to make sure that you are capturing and keeping their attention. So before when we talked about, hey, don't, you know, they're distracted, it's two o'clock, they got the five o'clock deadline, all that stuff, you do not have their attention. So you need to be able to capture it and then once you get it, you need to keep it. The third thing is you need to make sure that you are using the proper language that, that they can actually understand you. So you're not talking up here when they're down here and vice versa. And then the fourth thing is, there needs to be organization to your story. You know, I, I did this, then I did that, then I did that, here's what I learned, boom, 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 and so on. And then the fifth thing is getting them to care. I go into all of these specifically, and I would highly recommend that you, you just watch that uh, because I go through literally how to, in each of the sections, make sure that you're, 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 you're only giving them what they need. And then first thing is you also have to be in tune with their reactions. Are they starting to, you know, do that kind of stuff or, you know, are they nodding? Okay, I'm, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you, you got me. Um, the other thing is that I uh, also as a safety net, what I like to do is I like to outline the story that I'm going to tell you. You know, if, if I get asked this interview question, here's what I would share. Here's the way I would share it. And I give you all the script to how to do this. And then what I'd like to do is along the way, just kind of take a breath and say, you know, am I hitting the right level of detail? Am I giving you too much? Am I giving you too little? And get a little coaching from them to see if you're, if you're wandering or meandering or giving them stuff that they don't need to know. And I also, if you are really having problems with this, I would literally, if you can, get a friend or get a, uh, you know, if your wife or your partner or your friend or business colleague or whoever, rehearse a story. And let ask them, you know, did you need to know, you know, like, hey, I don't need to know that. Your story is, is, is fine without it. And, and, you know, you just might have to put a little extra effort in to, uh, to doing that. I know we laughed about this in one of my uh, private coaching sessions, but I don't know if you, if you guys know this, but I'm going to tell you, I'm telling all of you, the whole world here. If you are on my email list, which I hope you are, uh, and when I send you an email, I want you to know I slave over those things. I mean, I like, I write it, I rewrite it. I, because I want to make sure that you're getting the real me. It's got good energy. It's helpful. And it's all this stuff. Okay. It, it's, it is, it is a, a privilege, a literal, literally a privilege for you to invite me into your inbox and say, I'm cool with you sending me stuff. Even if you don't open all the emails, but it's very important to me. But it's not only important to me that you open the email, it's important to me that I'm sending you the exact right amount of information that you need for me to give you that lesson or entice you to watch the new video, whatever it is, or, or take the free book or whatever. So what I do is I write it, then I go through it, then I give it to Kara. So Kara is my partner in crime. She's got the blue wrench and she reads it. And then what she does is she's, she's more like you. And she, you know, cause I got all this stuff going on in my head and she reads it and she says, you know what, this is, something's missing. They're not going to know this or wait, they don't need to know that. That's just, that's just superfluous. Just get that out. So we go through this constantly. So, you know, it's, it's something that you might need to, to practice, but for any of you that are long winded, I would do that. It's important when you get in there that you shine. So anyway, that's a little side story there, but it, it matters to me because I, I appreciate everybody who subscribed to the YouTube channel and I appreciate everybody who has signed up for my, my email list. So, um, so I thank you for that and I, I, I consider it an honor and a privilege. So, okay, hope that helped. All right, Shar, Claire, oh wait, I gotcha. Gordon's in. Sasha, he's a boot camper. Daniel, he's a boot camper. Shar's a boot camper. Kara's got a wrench. Here we go. Um, Shar, actually, actually for everybody, um, this was not a question. Uh, Shar was asking Gordon if he applies the star technique. I do not like the star technique. I would not use the star technique ever, ever. I don't know who invented it. I don't care who invented it. I would not use it. Um, 
I, I want, there are different elements that you need to make sure you're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna glaze over if you're telling, if you're using the star technique for me. I, I, I want, there needs to be a certain, the five elements that I just rattled off the previous question, there needs to be a cohesion in the way in which you tell the story. And I, and people, people think more in terms of time and steps and outcomes. So situations, tasks, and, and all that good stuff and results, it's, it's not always the way they want, they, the human mind can process it. So if you tell me, this is what I did first, and in step one, I did boom, boom, boom. Here's what I learned. Here's what, here's what happened. Then I went on to step two. You're giving me in time sequence, and there's an organization to the story. It's easy for me to process, and you're not taking extra you know, brain power of mind to follow you. So I'm not a big fan of the star technique. Um, so I just, I, I, I would not study that at all. That's my, it's my opinion. I mean, it, you know, but I know a lot of people, they like it because they, it's a commonly known, but just because it's commonly known doesn't mean it's good. So I know I beat that one up. Hey, Connie. Hey, hope your interview went well last night. We were talking about you on the session after you left, I think. Uh, Davida, great to see you. Daniel is a boot camper. Dave Wired's a boot camper. I love this, man. I'm testing out email. Okay, let's go. Boom, 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 boom. Hey, Jan, how are you? Rory's here. Hey, hey, what's the good word to you, buddy? Steve, how are you from Hotlanta? Jill is in the house. Another boot camp. Cecilia's here. Hey, how are you? Joy from Dublin. Love it. That's right. Ro Rory, you're, you're, you know, I didn't know you were from Canada. I think I, I was thinking you were from Texas. All right. Amy K, how are you? Uh, Sasha, I don't know what, uh, what that is. Steve, uh, oh wait, this is, okay, wait, I'm glad somebody asked this. The job search master class that I ran, uh, so if you have not seen this, this is now going to serve as a prelude to you. The, I did a job search master class, I believe, I did it live. It was kind of 30 minutes of teaching and then we did like, you know, two hours of Q&A uh, each day for three days in a row, for three days in a row. And the job search master class was, um, it, it talks about the, the number one factor in finding the right job for you. The second thing we do is we talk about how to find that job the fastest. And the third thing the master class does is we talk about how to make sure that when you got the interview, you nail it and you secure the job. It's three parts. I put an 11 or 12 page workbook together. It had all the stuff in it, all the job search plans, all that. Right now, you can't get it anymore. So I, it was on YouTube and it was for three days and I kept emailing my list to make sure you grab it. However, I have repackaged it in a different format and uh, in the next couple of weeks, we are gonna be recirculating it uh, so that you can get into, you can get into it and get the workbook. So Steve, if you were, if you were, um, if you follow me on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, anywhere that you want to be, I'm there. By the way, I mean, I always encourage you, I'll have the conversation with you wherever you want. Um, you will start to see, um, social media posts from us that mention the job search masterclass program. It's it, now it's inside of the mile walk Academy. It's still free. It's still free. Um, but we're repackaging it, and while it is being repackaged, it's not available. So um, I know that doesn't do you any good right at the moment, but it will be available again shortly, very shortly. All right. Hey, Maggie, how are you? Genius Kofi Anglo got from Ghana. Great to have you. D Raleigh from the backyard. Hope you're doing great, D. Nice W75. Jill's a Texan. We know that. Okay, Steve. Um, are the job search masterclass videos available through the career coach? Steve, you know what? If you, I might, I, I don't know that I recognize your name. If you are in the Mile Walk Academy, you're a paying student, uh, just email me and I will send it to you. <laughs> so that's the difference. You should, you as a paying student, get access to stuff that other people don't get access to, and I don't want you waiting. So email support at milewalk.com and we will get it to you. And we will also give you links to the videos inside the Mile Walk Academy.
Hey, Ben. Ben is here? Yes, Ben, I have my... Actually, this is tea. Man, I had a lot of coffee this morning. Oh, by the way, hold on. I don't know. I know my buddy Jim Vassalobliz and I are... Have you guys, have you guys seen the Leadership Podcast? It's awesome. They talk to leaders. And I was their guest Monday night. Monday night, uh, we, we had a powwow. It was about an hour long. And it will be coming out in a few months. In fact, that's how backed up these guys are. And uh, meaning with the number of people that they've interviewed, uh, people like Daniel Pink and a lot of other, you know, he was recent, um, but a lot of really, really prominent folks. Um, but check it out if you have not. Kristen, how are you? Yes, from Nashville, one of my favorite cities. Adam Turner, it's late where you are. No, it's dinner time. All right, just buzzing down here. Hey, Wendy. Hey, Sue. Connie's a boot camper. Connie, please email me and let me know how your interview went. Please, thank you. Okay. Lisa, how are you? I think you're in a boot camp too. Okay, wait. I think I got a question here. The zombie review is Rory, for those of you who don't know Rory. Uh, she said, I was still a top candidate. In my, did I miss something? And my references were called yesterday. Awesome. Is there anything I can do or say in the next interview to take the heat off the fact that I'm not in the industry right now? No, don't worry about that. You've got industry experience. I can say this to you because I know that you've got industry experience and then you had your job outside the industry and now you're going back. Um, if she's checking references, you've got to be in good shape. I don't know. Wait, the interview went well. She was up front. Oh, there were candidates with more experience. Sorry, I missed that. I didn't know it was a question. Um, a hit on me that I'm not in the industry right now. Well, what I, uh, I, I know you're you're in the, um, oh, I don't know if you're in the, in, well, I think you're in the interview course. or I don't think you're in the boot camp. But um, I always recommend whenever you're in the interviewing process, that one of the things that you do to close the interview effectively is to make sure you ask the interviewer if they have any reservations about hiring you. If you ask that question, Rory, reservations come in one of three forms. They misunderstood something you said, in which case you can now clarify it. They made an assumption about you because they didn't investigate it and they assumed wrong, like you didn't have experience but they didn't ask you about it and you didn't know to tell them. Or they have a reservation, it is an actual reservation, and at least now you know what it is. So what you're doing right now is you're speculating um, that it could be about the lack of industry or recent industry experience. That may not be true. That may not be true. It could be that their solution knowledge that somebody else has. I would want to find that out. So in the next interview, what I would do is I would make sure that I would probably ask that uh, up front. Um, not not like, do you have any reservation, but you know, kind of where do I fare against the other individuals that you are interviewing, and how do I fit in the overall scheme of this, and you know, kind of strengths and 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 gaps and and those kind of things. But I hope that helps. Kirk Simmons, how are you? Bernie V, good to see you. Another boot camper. Oh, Kyra, thank you. Um, yeah. By the way, folks, I, I don't know if you I don't know if you know this. Um, the hiring prophecies. You, uh, you know, this book I think is thirty-five bucks. Uh, I will at some point be offering this out to the HR community. But uh, if you are in the boot camp, you get this. Uh, you get the ebook and the audio book. If you want access to it, um, you can get uh, the ebook and the audio book, the recording, and I will mail you a copy. Uh, you can get this on the Mile Walk Academy website, but. To know this and what the HR and recruiters and hiring officials ought to be, how they ought to be evaluating you, I would want to know not only what it is that they should be doing, but what the counter tactics are as an as a candidate. So I wrote the interview intervention book in 2012. I wrote the hire this hiring prophecy. Actually, I wrote Out of Reach but Insight: Using Goals to Achieve Your Impossible in 2013. It came out in 2014. And then I wrote this book in 2015, um, and it won the award in 16. But it's it is really good. It's there's a lot of decision making stuff in there, and the things that the employers should be looking at for you as a job candidate of how to do things effectively. 
but it has a lot more information than the interviewing book does. So it's, you know, if you want to grab it, it's probably worth it, especially if you're having a difficult time in your job search. Okay, um, let me see. Gordon's got a question. If given the choice of interview slots, is there a preferred order to be seen? I get this question a lot. Gordon, it is a fantastic question, and there are so many variables that it's almost impossible to give you a short answer that will cover, should I go first, should I go last? You know, if I'm given the choice on Friday, I'm not going last. I'm going first thing in the morning. I'm happy, it's the weekend, I'm fresh as an interviewer, I wanna go first. Uh, if it's Tuesday, I might wanna go last. Is it the first interview in the process? Is it the last interview in the, meaning is it like, okay, we're gonna do all the initial first round interviews, that matters. Is it, hey, we've got three candidates, we've all been through the process and we're ending? All that, it, it all it all's different. So I can't give you a, a specific because I would give you a different answer depending on which number round it was, which uh, day of the week it was, and all that good stuff. So I'm not gonna go through all the permutations of all that, but it's, it's a great question. The one thing that I would say, so you can walk away with some, don't sweat it, don't sweat it. You know what? Chances are, if you're the best candidate and, and you do the things that we've coached you to do, as far as your storytelling and all that stuff, you'll get picked, you will. You will if you do it right. Uh, Cindy, I'm not sure what higher view is if that's a, um, I'm not sure what higher view is. All right, I'm here. Oh, mom's here. Hey mom, how are you? I know I haven't called in a long time. I'm sorry, mom. <laughs> okay, uh, but that's because I'm trying to save all these people from heartburn and I wanna get them jobs. So you be, please be proud of me. All right. Um, Thomas, Mim, do you know any IT support? Uh, do you know any IT? Do you know any in IT support that's hearing impaired? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I'm not. I'm not sure how to answer you. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what you mean. Okay, Carl Stokes, how are you? Congratulations on your. Uh, congratulations on your victory, Carl. Trisha, how are you? Steve, how are you? Great to have you. Can we give Steve a big newbie hug to live office hours? Hey, folks, if you're loving this, hit the thumbs up button, man. YouTube loves the action. Um, we're, you know, we still got a little time here where I'm going to be going through questions. Pansy, oh, hey, Pansy, how are you? Haven't seen you in a while. Ken Johnson, great to see you. Anna, Anna. Oh, come on, Anna. I hope you're doing okay. All right, nice W75. Andy, I heard something disturbing. Uh-oh. All right, wait, nice W75. Andy, I heard something disturbing. A colleague said someone had to hide their true education levels so she could get hired. Hiring managers get very intimidated by staff more educated than them. Thoughts? No, I do not believe that. Um, I do think that, yes, that could happen because I'm never to say never and always because there's a 7 billion people and there's all kinds of different variations of their reactions and that kind of stuff. I would not hide my education uh, at all. If I didn't have an, my degree and I was a veteran, like, you know, 10, 20 years of work experience, I would not worry. If I have a PhD, I would not take it off of my, uh, my resume. Uh, folks, be proud of your accomplishments. And you know what? If a, if a company, you know, this is more of an opinion than a piece of advice. If a company doesn't want to hire you because they're worried that you're too smart or too awesome, you don't want that company. You don't want to work for that company and you definitely don't want to work for that boss. So, you know, I would not be taking off my credentials. I would make sure that I have a two-page resume, no more, and I'm I'm putting in there everything that is all the goodness that is me, that is you, and I would be proud of that. And so, yes, I can understand that. Yes, it might happen. 
I don't think it happens very often. That is a very unique situation and I would not want to work for that company. And if that, if that person had to take uh, her education off or his education off, um, I would be thinking long and hard about whether I wanted to go to work for a company that I had to take my education off. And Jill, and Jill, who's a boot camper, says the same thing, and that's that. I just, man, that's just nuts. All right, let me, oops, try to get, ooh, yow. Let me see, boom, 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 Jill, hey, I'm just looking for the next question. Hey, Leslie. Yeah, folks, um, Kara put in the link to the three keys to ace any job interview webinar. I'm gonna, when we package all this up, I will put the links in the description of the live office hours. Um, you know, this will be, you know, YouTube records this and it just goes on my channel. All right, Rory, my interviewer asked a list of questions, a lot, yes, no questions and answers. That means 90% of the answers are the same from candidate to candidate. How do I separate myself? You always, always want to add color. Um, you know, if, if you ask me a yes or no question in the interview, you're the interviewer, I'm the candidate, you ask me a yes or no, I know you're not a good interviewer. So I need to help you uh, get information that's going to help you make a better decision. So if I have a yes, then I'm going to say yes and, and if I got a no, I'm going to say no but, um, and I'm going to go. I'm just going to keep talking. I would not stop at yes or no. I would not stop at yes or no. Wait, by that I mean I li is literally a list of questions she wrote the answers on. Now, yeah, I... I just, I would give more color. I, I would give more color. I was writing it or I was saying it. Okay, Giovanni. Uh, when an offer requests for an accounting degree, is it safe to assume they mean they want a master or should someone try even if they have a bachelor? If they ask for an accounting degree, any accounting degree will do. Bachelors, masters, Hopefully you got a CPA and all that good stuff. By the way, I know people don't believe me when I say this. 200 organizations I've recruited for. There's something like 15, 1800 companies we interviewed. We asked questions. Do you actually require a degree? Even when you put it on the job description? No. So the, the thing that you guys got to know is when an employer puts together a job description, it is the kitchen sink. That's their preferred requirements. So when they say required, and then they say nice to have, and then traits, and then education, and so forth, you need to look at that job and determine if you are in fact a fit based on what the job really needs. And if you don't have 10 years of experience, but you have seven and you're awesome, go. If you don't have a degree, but you have 20 years of work experience, go. In you go. So trust me when I tell you, you might be thinking that they're knocking you out. And some of the employers might be, but most of the employers are not. And I've told this story before, literally in the 15 year history of Mile Walk, which is my executive recruitment firm, we've recruited for over 200 companies we recruit, mostly white collar workers always most of them are six figures or you know 80k or up but six figures and more 200 plus companies and only one of those companies one of those companies absolutely required a college four-year college degree for those positions and these are tall jobs tall jobs but if somebody didn't have a degree but they were you know a great engineer or a great salesperson or whatever they they still hired them there were a few exceptions some cfo stuff here and there um but when i what i'm talking about is like yeah that that person needed to have it the cfo needed but all the other people that even though they wanted degrees didn't actually have to have them i mean it's crazy and that one company that did want the degrees they wanted them from like preferential schools like it had to come from like certain schools it was just like nuts but uh trust me 
I know it says degree required or you need 10 years or you need this and that. That's what they're hoping for. That's what they're hoping for. You, you've got to look at, do you have the experience where you can do that job effectively? And yes, you might get screened out by the applicant tracking system. Then you need to work harder to go in at it through the back door or through the front door or whatever. But I trust me when I tell you, um, I would not be, I would not be shy about finding a way to get my resume in front of somebody, even if I didn't have the exact degree they were looking for, or I didn't have a degree. And don't get me wrong, if you're 22 and they're looking to hire somebody at that level, a, 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 a junior resource, and they say degree required, in that case, you need a degree. You need a degree because they've got to have some kind of screening to know you've got either the life skills, the organizational skills, the whatever. If you've been working for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, it's a different ball game. It really is. It really is. Trust me. I know. You know, and, and some of you are out there probably shaking your head going, well, you know, I they bounced me because I didn't have a degree. Yeah, that happens in some cases, but I'm talking about the lion's share of the majority of companies that are out there. So I don't want you to be bashful. I want you to keep going. I want you to keep going. Boom, boom, boom. Thanks, Henry. All right, let me see. I'm coming up. We got to close it up. Hey, Joan, let me see if I can get one more in here. Uh, let me, I like this one from Bernie. All right, Bernie, Bernie V. This is a great one, and I like that it was on point with what we talked about today. Um, Bernie's asking, what are more questions we can ask a hiring manager to really get a better idea of the culture? So the first thing that I like to do when I'm assessing the culture and by the way, I'm going to use me as a, an example because um, as, I, as I mentioned or have alluded to, I know some of you know, I run a, an executive search firm called Milewalk. When we go and take searches from companies who are looking to hire people, one of the first things we ask them is, can you define the culture? So we need the specifics. So literally, I ask them, can, what are the adjectives you would use to describe the culture? So I want the adjectives first. Then, like I shared with you in the in the talk, what does each one of them mean? So when you say self-starter, what does that mean? When you say organized, what does that mean? When you say entrepreneurial, what does that mean? Yeah, I want to know, is it written down anywhere? You know, we go through all this stuff. What's the list? What's the definition? And how do you evaluate it in an interview? You can ask, what's the list? Could you define them? What you can even say, what are your favorite cultural characteristics? What are your least favorite cultural characteristics? Anything that gets them talking about the culture and the adjectives and then how they would define them. And then what you want to do as an extension of all of that is you want to ask them for examples. When did somebody demonstrate that they were entrepreneurial? So not just t tell me the definition. Give me an example of when somebody did that. So if you're telling me that somebody is a self-starter, Who's the first person that comes to mind that you would say is the greatest self-starter in your company and why? And what do they do? And get them to give you real life examples. And if they can't, what does that tell you? What does that tell you? Right? So then they really don't, aren't filled with self-starters because if the culture is so we have self-starters, then I shouldn't have to think more than a nanosecond about an example of what where I find one of those. So think about that. Right? What is it? How'd you define it? Who? And by the way, I like the who question because when you say, give me an example, um, just say, it, you want them to think about somebody specifically. Then they can anchor on a story they can tell you that it's easier for them to recall than it is to try to think out of the, you know, out, 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 of, the, out of the blue sky. So that's what I would do. All right, folks, I got to run to a meeting. Tons of fun. If, 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 if you love it, hit the like button. If you want to make sure you're getting these every week, subscribe. And and one thing, if I did not get to your questions, one of the things that I do as a matter of practice is I go into my comments when, when I know you were here and I can see the chat because the chat stays with this. Get your comments into the comment section. Uh, once YouTube records this, you only got to wait a few minutes. YouTube records this, throw your question in there because what I do 
uh, like Fridays and, and the weekends is I try to go in and answer the questions on my YouTube channel and my blog. So, so please do that and I will do my best. And the faster you do it, the greater the likelihood that I can go in there and answer it before I get distracted in prepping for next week. Uh, Tuesday, we got a new video coming out. Next Thursday, I'm back with a new lesson. I haven't thought about it yet. If you got any ideas, throw them in the comment section. I'm happy to pick them out and talk with you about whatever you want. And don't forget to grab this. Don't forget to grab this. It's it's. We still have some left. Uh, I think I ordered some more too. Uh, but 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 grab it. It's free. It's just you got to pay for the shipping and handling. You get the ebook and the audiobook. All right, folks. Till next week. Hugs hugs all around. Talk to you soon. Have fun.